know the other three ahead of them in order. Who's number one, number two, number three? Yes, sir. Give, come on up here. I got an idea you know what you're talking about. <laughs> or if you're, either you just, I don't know, whatever. So what, what's number, who's number one? Georgia. Number two. Ohio State. Number three. Michigan. You got it, baby, right there. Let's hear it for the man. <laughs> All right. Who brought you today? Oh, did, did he, did Sean bring you? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty impressed, man. You've got some, got some good people here. Okay, fellas, we're going to crank it up. And I hope that you, if some of you have been here a lot over the years, some of you are new, some of you just getting started. But I want you to know that these uh, time, these lunches, which we do 12 times a year, unless some virus hits us and we cut it back a little bit. But uh, we want you to know, and I want you to know, I'm not here to waste your time. I'm here to hopefully challenge you to be all the man that God wants you to be and to get our butts off the bench and make a difference for Christ. Now, I got to tell you something. I don't, I don't know who you voted for or whatever. Even if you got everybody, your whole slate, they're in now. I just want to tell you something. It's not going to ultimately change our country. It can help us along. It can, do, it can do some good, positive things, whoever you voted for, maybe. Or maybe, maybe the people you voted for weren't going to. But anyway, <laughs> it's a deeper issue. If you want to change the country, you got to change people. And the only person that can change a person's heart, that's their mind, will, and emotions, is the one that made them through their son, his son, Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. I'm, I'm here to motivate you to make a difference through your life and your relationship with the Lord. I can't make you do it. I wish I could. I literally wish I had a magic potion and I could throw it out and, man, you get up and you get out of here and you would absolutely turn this place upside down. There are people that do that, by the way. You need to know there are men that I know in this country, in this state, and some in this city that absolutely do their business, do their work, earn their money, but their ultimate goal is to honor him and to make a difference in the lives of people. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to start now. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you that you never ask us to come together to waste our time, but always to help us to know you better and to follow you and allow you to work in and through our lives. Lord, there's not a man here today that's here by accident. There are going to be men here today, Lord, that are trying to figure life out. And maybe even with some here today, some crazy stuff has happened or is happening, and we're trying to figure it out. Well, Lord, today is going to be somebody's day because you are the answer to what we're trying to figure out. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, a pastor was an uneducated pastor. He, wasn't, he didn't go to cemetery, I mean seminary and all the things you're supposed to do if you're going to be highly educated, uh, kind of like me, being a PE major, I never felt I was really highly educated, but I like I liked to play sports. Anyway, he was an uneducated pastor, and he was visiting one day one of his uh, delinquent deacons. Now, if you don't know what a deacon is, if you're not a church person, that's a person in a church. Usually, it's a Baptist church, and they call them deacons. They elect them, and they kind of supposed to kind of give leadership to the church, etc. So anyway, he's talking to this delinquent deacon. He had been rather remiss with some of his responsibilities at the church. So during the course of the conversation, the deacon said to the pastor, the reason I ain't more active is I got a bad heart. The pastor said, totally ignoring what he said, he pressed in on his responsibilities until the man exploded. And he said, pastor, I can't be more active because I got a bad heart. Pastor said, turn to him and said, brother, there ain't nothing wrong with your heart. The trouble with you is there's something wrong with your liver because you ain't living right. <laughs> Boom. So this is not going to be necessarily a real uplifting Zig Ziglar way to start a talk, but I'm going to read it anyway because it needs to be, sometimes we need to, be, we need to hear sobering things from the Word. So a lot of us over the years, perhaps, 
uh, through church, through something like this, through a young, when you were a young person, you went to a retreat or a group where they talked about Christ, you become a Christian, you gave your life to Christ, he entered your life and, and came into you. But that's about it. You took step one, but step two, you didn't take step two yet. You got, you got splinters in your butt, you're in the pew, you do little good things here and there. So here's what Jesus says about that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful things, big things in your name, and when uh, then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you practice who you who practice lawlessness. Now, this the context of this, those three verses comes in verse 15, right ahead of it, where it says, Beware of false prophets. So it's talking about people that kind of are the um, they got a show. They come to town, they pull out all the tricks, they do all the stuff. You know what I'm talking about. That's the context. But then he brings it down, he applies it not only to those people because they're fakes and frauds, but he's saying there are people who know Jesus, who claim to know him, average people who are fakes too. Because he's saying the key to everything here, the whole key to everything is, is to do what Jesus says. Now listen to this, faith that saves and sends you to heaven does not remain alone. Faith alone won't get you there. You say, I'm a pretty good guy. I don't do any real bad stuff. Well, maybe a few things, and, but you know, I'm okay. And I'm sure God's going great on the curve, and, and I know he's in, and I ask him to come in, and that's the way it's going to be. Uh-uh. So if you read the little book in the Bible over the, towards the end of the Bible called James, the book of James says, faith without works is dead. He is not saying there that you have to do all this godly good stuff to go to heaven. He said, but if you've got the real deal, if Christ is really in you, then it's got to yield itself in how I live and the fruit that comes out of my life, his kind of fruit. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So uh, today, I'm going to take one verse, and not even the whole verse. I'm just going to take three or four words in one verse. And it comes uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. This is what it says. You, and this is Jesus speaking, you are the salt of the earth. The only salt. You can translate it from the Greek language which the New Testament is written in. You are the only salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And what he's saying here is, when you become the man I want you to be, and the character I develop in you is developed or developing in you, it will yield a life of influence. Salt is to be an influence in the lives of other people in the world in which we live today. And so here's a thought I just jotted down before I came over here. I know some of you are probably saying, well, can I be a, can't I be a Christian but not believe in the Bible? No. Because Jesus, the one you say you believe in, that you ask in your life, says, this word is true. He put his stamp of approval on it. Well, well, why? I mean, how can you trust Jesus? Well, did you just trust him? Did you ask him in? He put his stamp on it. He said, man does live, not live by bread alone, but by every word that, proceed, that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And so we've got to begin to think through this, because I know a lot of people that, again, get their ticket punched so they can go to heaven, but they never open this book up. I, that doesn't go together. Can you be uh, a Christian but not uh, do what Jesus wants you to do? No. It's impossible to have Christ in your life and not begin to develop and grow and mature day by day to become the person he wants you to, to, to be and, to, and do the things he wants you to do. But in Matthew 5, if you just turn back a couple pages, it's talking about the Beatitudes. And I've taught about these over the years a couple of times. I've gone through each one. So he's saying, if you, if you want to become the man I want you to be, 
then you have to have the attitudes that only I can give you. And that's in Matthew 5, uh, verses number 3 through, I think, number 12. And so he's saying these eight beatitudes are attitudes that are achievable with me working in you, developing them in you, and if they're developed in you, you will be the salt on the earth. How can I say this? Well, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> this is really powerful stuff. So where's the sphere? The sphere's on the earth. The sphere's in Dallas. The sphere's in your home. The sphere's in your work. The sphere is in your daily dealings. You and I are not here by accident, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So he wants us, while we're here, to make a difference. So again, this salt is to be an aseptic uh, influence. In other words, it prevents infection. We're supposed to be doing that kind of work on this planet, in our cities, wherever we are, in our neighborhoods, wherever it is, to check corruption, to ask people around us um, if they really have any hope. Ninety studies say that only that almost 95% of the Christians in America have never led one person to Jesus. You know, you may be the only Bible some people read. Some of you may be the only way that someone is going to know the way about Christ. So I was in Chicago with my wife uh, Saturday. We flew up there, and, you know, people talking bad about Chicago, and there are areas where it's really bad. We were downtown. I got to tell you, it's beautiful. It was great. We had a wonderful time. But we were there because my wife was getting her knee. Um, she's got a doctor there that we're going to go to, and Dr. Berger, who is going to do uh, a knee replacement. And since she was 10 years old, her kneecap has moved from side to side. It's not in there permanently. There's a medical name for that. And every once in a while since we've been married, she's had three really bad falls. Now, when she comes in here, and she won't be here today because it's giving her a lot of problem right now, and we're going to go in January to get that operation. But we're sitting in the hotel restaurant having brunch on Sunday. And um, one of the things I've learned over the years is, as a follower of Jesus, i got to be alert all the time. I, I, not, you say, well, John, that's what you do. It's who I am. Jesus Christ is is my leader. I don't do it because I've got a DR in front of me. I don't do it because I've been to seminary or all these other things. I do it simply, first of all, because I'm a follower of Jesus. And that's what we're all supposed to be doing. So we're sitting there, and this guy's waiting on us. And Man, he can't get the coffee right. It's, it's, it's not hot. We send it back. Could you make it a little hotter? Three times. But a get young guy, really, really nice guy. So finally... I took the punky, I said, all right, we had eaten, we had a great breakfast, it was a brunch, and it was really good. I said, it's time, it's time. You say, how do you know it's time for it to say something to someone about the Lord? You know. If you're following Jesus, you know. He tells you. I don't, I've never heard Jesus speak audibly. But if you stay close to him, he gives you the nod. So... A guy comes over, you got, you got everything? Yeah, we got everything we need. You got a minute? He said, yeah. I said, if you sit down, what is it, are you going to get in trouble? I mean, this is a really nice place. He said, no, I'm fine. We're, everybody's about gone. You're, you're come some of the last people here for, for breakfast. So I said, sit down then. So I got to ask you a question. I said, um, in the next 30 seconds, if you had a heart attack and fell over and died, where are you going? Well, this guy's rather bright, and he sits up, and it's, it really got to him. And he said, he lowered his voice and almost mumbled it. And he said, I, I hope it's heaven. I said, you hope? Is that the best you've got? I said, what if I could tell you you could know? Would you want to know that? And he said, well, sure, I'd want to know. I said, by the way, you don't know when you're going to go. There's no guarantee that you have tomorrow for none of us. So I said, okay, here's the deal. And I just, in 30 seconds, I did. 
A Christian is a person that has Jesus in their life. He only comes in by invitation. He is not going to beat you over the head with the Bible. He's not going to barge his way in. But once you say who he is, the Son of God, God in a body, lived, died, and rose from the dead so that you could have your sins forgiven, you could have a life beginning now and a life forever with him. I said, that's what this is all about. But you've got to accept the offer. So I looked at him. I said, so are you, are you ready to accept the offer? Have you ever done that? In fact, I draw my little, drew my little circle, put a cross outside the circle. I said, if this circle is you, he's got to be in you. Is he in or out? He said, I don't know. I said, well, then you need to know. And I'd never done this before. I said, Ian, Ian was his name. I said, I want you to look at me. And I'm sitting right next to him. I said, I, want you to, I don't want you to close your eyes. I want you to look at me. I'm going to have a little prayer. There's no magic in the prayer, in the words. It's just to facilitate you asking Christ to graciously come in your life. And I want you to say it out loud. I don't want you to be mumbling something. Because this is going to change your life. So he said, okay. He looks right at me, and I prayed the prayer. Jesus, come into my life now. Clean me up. And from this day forward, help me to become the man you always wanted me to be. Amen. He prayed it, and he never blinked his eye. So we talked a little bit more. I got his address. I said, I'm going to send you something. As soon as I get back, and it was mailed out yesterday, a Bible, a book, so he could get started. Well, we went in the next day. I didn't think he would be there. He comes over. He, he calls us by name, Punky John. By the way, I did, the, when we left, I didn't want him to think I was one of those cheap Christians. I gave him a very nice tip. <laughs> so, I, so I slipped a $50 bill, which I do as often as I can. I always carry a 50 in my pocket. I got one here right now. So don't be, don't be schmoozing up to me today, okay? <laughs> but I love to give my 50s away when people aren't expecting it. When I put it in his hand after he had accepted Christ, he didn't know that benefit was going to come that soon. But I slipped it in there, and he looked down. He literally gasped. He's, people don't do that often. Some people do. Some of you probably do. that. We need to do more of that. So, so we talked to him, and I, I said, I need you to write your address down. Now. I don't want you to email me. So he did, and we had a great time. We hugged, and we left. Let me tell you, gentlemen, that's been salt. And there's not a man in this room that knows Christ that can't do that and is expected by God for you to do that. You say, well, I don't know if I, I like your approach. Well, then you use your approach. If you want to learn how to do it, call me up. Nobody ever calls me up and comes in and say, hey, teach me how to do this. That's what I do. That's what I've done for 50 years of my life. I teach people one-on-one, -on -one, in my office, wherever, over a cup of coffee. I'll answer your questions best I can. But I can't answer them. I'll send, them to, send you to somebody that knows. So why, why, why are we doing Why are we being the salt that he wants us to be? Listen, this is all about impact. He left us here to impact the hearts and lives of other people. Somebody said it this way, the character of the, of the influence is the influence of the character. You want to make a difference? you got to have the character change. And it happens initially when you come to Christ, but every day he's working in you if you do the things he tells you to do that will enable you to grow. you got to work with him. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you hear people, work with me now. Work. you got to work with him. Everything, listen, when you became a Christian, if you are one, everything you need to be all God wants you to be, you already got it. Everything. You've got the power. You've got the, the, the manual of operation. You've got everything you need. I am sick and tired of Christians in this country. Well, I just don't know enough. Well, I don't want to lose a friend. Well, I, come on. We're talking about the eternal consequences of a human being. We've got to get over that. I mean, we'll go in and raise, a, you know, $50 million for a deal, man, and we don't blink. But we can't sit down with somebody and say, where are you going? Well, I don't know enough Bible. Carry one with you. Write it on a flip card, whatever. All you need is one or two verses. 
All you need to say is, well, let me tell you what's happened to me. That's it. He says, be my witnesses. That's simply what, what, what have you experienced in 30 seconds? Do you, you ought to have an elevator speech. This wasn't even my main talk. We got to get on past this thing. <laughs> I'll never get past this today. I'm only going to do a little bit. But anyway, so someone said it this way about behaving, behaving differently. Only way we are different as Christians is that we are not like a lot of other people. We don't do this. We don't do that. We don't do other things. In fact, we don't do nothing. That's not good. That's not good. And the Scripture does say, just to kind of encourage us a little bit, the Lord says, there's going to come a day where I'm, we're going to say, I'm going to have a talk, and I'm going to take, a, I'm going to take an assessment of what you did while, I, while you were down there and after I came in your life. Oh, you won't, you won't miss heaven. You'll go to heaven because once he's in you, you're set. But how can you take a gracious gift that we don't deserve at all and then take it and then do nothing with it to show our appreciation to him? And the way you show, and we show our appreciation to him is to see more about him, love him first in our lives, and then do what he says. That's it. I remember the first time I tried to fare, share my faith after I came to know Christ in the tenth, going into the 10th grade in school in Bradenton, Florida. I went home. I had a stepfather who didn't know God from Donald Duck. We had no relationship with each other. Uh, I walked in, and I sat down, and as nicely as I could, I said, I talked about what had happened to me that weekend, and I talked about Jesus and you know what he did? He got up, went over in the corner, picked up a bat, and ran me out of the house. Now, how's that one for a start? Yeah, that, would that make you flinch the next time? Well, I don't think I'm going to bring this up anymore. Oh, no. Because once you got the real deal and you know the magnitude of what happened, when you ask him in and who he is, you don't shy away anymore. It's the greatest thing you, that will ever happen to you the greatest person you will ever know. So, in Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. When you by your bodies, it means all of you, everything about you. There's going to come a day when those of us who held back, whatever we held back, whether sharing Christ with others or of or the, the money, which is not ours, it's his, the health we had to get it. We gotta, we, he, says, don't, he said, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. The problem is we sacrifice for a moment, but we keep crawling off the altar. A living sacrifice. This is truly the way to worship him. Then it says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person, a new man, by changing the way you think. As a man thinketh, so is he. Then you will learn, learn a process to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. He's got the plan. Do you, have you guys over the years ever had a restlessness about yourself and you've been doing a certain job or a certain work or whatever and you just feel like, man, this is not getting it done. I, I want to do something else. And then you say, well, I want to do something else after that. And then you want to do something else. Well, what we really need to be after if we know the Lord is what is his will. To go through this life and know Christ but miss his will, that's a big miss. So he wants us to know this stuff. And so how... How do we influence the world without became, becoming influenced by the world? Because Jesus said, be in it, but don't be of it. We've got to be smart where we go. If you say, well, you know, my buddy, and he's a client, he wanted to go to a strip joint, so I'm going to go to the strip joint, but it doesn't bother me. Oh, come on. If that doesn't bother you, then you've got another problem. <laughs> Check your batteries. So how do we not get influenced? How are we going to be in it but not be? Listen to this. It says in Romans 12, 2 in the J.B. Phillips paraphrase, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. How many of you are in the grip of the world right now and squeezing the, the life out of you? 
what is it in particular that's squeezing you? <laughs> oh, boy. So how do we keep from losing our saltiness? How do we keep from the saltiness about our lives to be diluted? Where we're just like everybody else, there's nothing different or unique about us, and we're not making any difference. Now, here's a proposition I want to make you. Staying salty is the equivalent of growth in godliness, becoming more like he wants you to be. If I had a target on the wall, and the target, the bullseye, was what God's goal is for you and me once we come to know Christ, what would you say it is? Romans 8, 29, read the book, it's right in there. He says, the goal of the Christian life is to become like Jesus. Do the things that he would do. Do the priorities that he would do. Do the things in the book that he's already laid out. Progressively, in his character, in his likeness, become like him. That's the goal. Every day I get up, I try to say before my heat, feet hit the floor, I try to say, Lord, help me today to understand where I'm, I'm not like you Help me to be more like you. Here's the prayer I pray every morning when I get up. That wasn't a prayer. That was kind of a mumble. Here's the prayer I pray. Jesus, be the Lord of my life today in new ways. Help me to do only those things you want me to do and to do them in your power. I pray it every day. I got a whole list of people I pray that for have asked me to pray that for them. And they pray that same prayer every morning all over the country for me every day that I won't give in, that I won't give up, that I won't screw up. How about that one? It takes work. Become like Jesus. Christianity has not so much been tried and found it wanting as it has been found difficult and left untried. Let me tell you, you want a challenge? I, I met with a group of guys years ago when I used to live here in Dallas. There were five of us. One of the guys, he's pretty well known in this city still, he was raising $100 million to build a building, an office building, and I won't tell you what it is or where it is, and some unique things about it downtown in Dallas. So he was working with some guys in London and so forth. He, he got the money. But the point of all that was, he said, John, in the midst of all of this, it's so easy for me to get distracted from what's really important. This guy really loves the Lord. And, and, but he was saying... I have got, it, it, I don't want to give up. I want to honor him and what I do in this project. And, and, I, and he said often, he said, listen, as big a project and as demanding it is to raise this money and all the rest of it, he said, the greatest challenge in my life is to follow Jesus. The most rewarding thing in my life, he says, is to follow Jesus. And, I, and, and the platform I have to impact people is my work. And those relationships. Listen, no, well, listen, you and I, and I say this all the time, you and I are no more prepared for heaven than the moment you came to Christ or asked Christ in. And the question I always ask is, so if you're no more prepared for heaven than when you came to know Christ, why did he leave us here? Why didn't he just beam us on up into heaven? Because he had a purpose for us here. He doesn't need us. He chooses to use us. And it's an honor. The Apostle Paul and other greats, you can read in the New Testament, they call themselves bond servants, bond slaves. No rights of our own. We're totally subservient to our master, Jesus. So when we get up in the, in the morning, we should say, Lord, I've got a, a schedule here, but what's your schedule? Anything you want me to kind of scratch off here and do that? I'm telling you, let me tell you, you're talking about an adventure. It doesn't get any greater. And this, that little thing in Chicago, oh, I've got all kinds of those. Man, that just absolutely lights me up to know that God could use this one old boy's life right here to impact somebody's life for eternity. It doesn't get any better than that. Second Peter 3.18 says, but you've got to grow and keep on growing in your love for Christ. You've got to keep growing and develop. If you're not growing, you are dying, spiritually speaking. And it's the basics. I've often said again, if I know the basics and live the basics of the faith, 
I am going to be light years ahead of everybody else. I know people that are educated, sitting in church every Sunday, listening to great sermon. They're educated way beyond their intelligence. <laughs> Think about that. It was right over your heads, wasn't it? <laughs> Thinking and equating, getting all that input and good input, boy, that, that, that does it. I got my dose for the week. That's not even nearly what he wants for you and me. You got to get the basics down. I love what the Bob Ojeda picture for the Dodgers said. He said, we've been working on the basics because basically we've been having trouble with the basics. <laughs> Just know the basics. And I'm going to get into a couple of the basics right now. George Orwell said, the, 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 the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. You're getting any heat for speaking for Christ? If you're not, you need to speak up. The scripture said, it's, Paul said, it's an honor to suffer for Christ. But we duck and hide. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, come on. Man up. Suit it up. Speak up. There's more at stake here than just how we feel or whether we're afraid or we don't want to offend somebody. Offend some people. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. All right, then I'm going to get into a couple things here, but let me give you one or two more. Some of us have been running in the same place for too many years with Jesus. It's kind of like, here's where we are, and we're running in place. My friend John Gillespie, you've met, some of you have met him before, played football at Missouri, inducted into the Hall of Fame a few years ago, just had a hip surgery last week. He's going to be back. He's strong. He's tough. I'd have hated to have been on, in front of him on the line. He would have eaten people. He ate people's lunch. But anyway, he said when he's like five or six years old, he said he and his sister were very competitive with each other, and their dad got him out in the front yard and said, all right, I want the two of you to race down to the fence and back, and whoever wins is going to be a prize. They take off, and they get back, and his sister, he said, was like 25 feet ahead of him, and he felt awful. But then his dad gave him a wonderful pep talk and this wise wisdom. He said, John, you're running in the same place too long. <laughs> and that's what we do. You know, running in the same place gets boring. Same old routine, same old stuff, same old programs, same old restaurants. Man, you want something to spice yourself up. Okay. Okay. So, there are five ways, and I'm only probably going to get to one of, ooh, half of one. We'll, we'll pick this up next week. And then I'll throw a little thought in about Thanksgiving, because that was the talk next week, but this is more important. There are five things that will always be the same five things for eternity that we need if we're going to grow up and be the men that God wants us to be in our homes in our workplace, with our friends, in our decisions, to be salt and to make the difference. He said, you're the only salt. Ain't no more salt anywhere else like his salt. What he could do in us and through us. Let me tell you, the greatest thing in your life is going to be one day when you wrap it all up. If you give yourself to people for Christ's sake and you begin to see people come to Christ. By the way, don't be afraid. You don't have to convert them. You can't. That's his job. Our job is simply to tell the story, to point to him. When John the Baptist came, if you read the Gospel of John, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. And when they asked, what is your job? He said, I'm a pointer. All I do, my whole job, my whole reason for existence is to point to him, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. What an honor for us to be pointers you can't have any higher honor than to be a pointer. Are you pointing? So the first thing, and we'll, we'll uh, take maybe one thought here on this first one because it's long, and that is you got to have a daily intake of the Word of God. Got to have it. It says in uh, Ephesians 4.1, I beg you, each, each one of you, to lead a life worthy of your calling. What is your calling? To follow Jesus and become like him. That's our, that's our call. So how are you doing with that? A daily intake, not a monthly intake, 
not twice a year intake, not if I'm really in a bad spot, I better get back to the Bible intake. You know, an apple a day keeps the doctor. No, uh-uh. This is a big time. How many, you know, I guarantee you most of us do not miss a meal. Looking around the room, I can tell that. <laughs> and you know one of my weak points is snacking at night. I mean, I'll get up at 2 or 3 in the morning, can't sleep, and I think of that bluebell downstairs. It's like a magnet. <laughs> Come on down, get a scoop. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so here's a thought. You and the Bible, you and the Bible, you and the Word. This book, the Bible, will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives. <laughs> is the Word shaping your life, or is the world squeezing you into its own mold? So many Christians are under the Word of God. In other words, we sit in the pew and somebody's preaching at us, but very few are in it. If I don't teach you to love this book and love Jesus and how to get in it, I've not done my job. If your preacher, wherever you go to church, is not emphasizing this and teaching you how to get in it, then he is not doing his job. You say, well, he's not doing it. Well, go ask him to help you. Go ask him to help you. Okay, I'm going to close with this quote because I got it's time to stop. And I'm going to use it again next week as we close. A.W. Tozer, one of the greatest, godliest writers and men, I don't know how old, he's probably 300 years old, but this is what he said. Sin is a terrible thing, and either we deal with it and deal with our sin, or our sin will deal with us. I think the thing that keeps most of us running in place, whether we're a Christian or not, it's sin. Disobedience, not doing what God wants, at least trying to do it. We won't do it perfectly. That's sin. So what sin's blocking you? I had a guy I met with the other day, and he said, you know, John, I've been tempted to go back to the porn. I haven't done it yet. It used to eat me up. I got free. But I'm tempted. I don't want to go back. So what are you tempted with? you got to deal with that stuff, fellas, or you're going to end up running a place and even running backwards the rest of your life. And that's not, the, that's not the way he wants you to go. So, fellas, if you don't know Christ today, I'm going to do like I did with the guy at the restaurant in Chicago. You don't have to say it out loud, but look at me right now. And if you want to make sure Christ is in you or you know he's not and you want to get this done, and you'll ne by the way, you'll never be disappointed with Jesus. No one will ever love you like he loves you, ever. So just pray this little prayer. Jesus, come into my life. Clean me up. Stop my seeking and searching for something because I've found it in you. Help me to become from this day forward the man you've always wanted me to be. And then, Lord, for us here who know you, maybe some of us a long time, we're good people, church-going people, but we know there's more. Help me, Lord, to fall in love with you. And you said, if I love you, then I'll do what you want me to do. Help me, Lord, to get off the bench. Become the man you want me to be while I'm here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Last one next week.